Tubi. Just an app away. An endless scroll of content. Good movies, bad movies, sci-fi, horror, drama, comedy, and it's free. What to watch? Time is limited. In rolls three men. Matthew Tangent, an angry ginger with a taste for cheese. Rick Morgan, a podcasting juggernaut with a growing catalog. Danny Bennett, a simple man with a love for film. They're here to help. Braving the wilds of movie anarchy to find hidden gems for you and having fun along the way. Three men and a Tubi. Recommendations for today's thrifty movie box. Welcome to Three Men in a Tubi, the show with good friends, good times, and hopefully good movies for the Thrifty Movie File, where we review a movie on the free platform Tubi and tell you whether or not it is worth your time. As always, I'm here with my two co-hosts, Rick Morgan. Because you're once, twice, three times a Tubi. <laughs> and Matthew Tangen, the angry ginger. Yo. That's all I got. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's enough because I think we are about to launch into an episode where we tell people to either steer clear of or head straight toward a free movie on Tubi that um, it's a little out of our wheelhouse, I think. We haven't done one like this that I can remember, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. Me and we've only done one movie so far? Yeah, we haven't done one like this yet. <laughs> Uh, and we might never again. That's the other part. <laughs> That's true. This week, we have decided, um, I selected the movie this week, and I selected um, Mordecai, a Johnny Depp movie from 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, it was just one of those things. I was scrolling through it. I said, this looks like it had a pretty uh, momentous release. And I remember seeing some commercials for it. And I said, this is what it's about. I'm going to take my time to check it out for you and tell you what I think. So you can decide if it's, um, if it's worth going after. What do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking you were just going through and finding the picture with the dude with a mustache or something. <laughs> uh, when he sent it, when he sent it to me, I was like, that's 100% Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I do tend to scan the internet for pictures of mustachioed gentlemen for you know, multiple reasons. Uh, um, yeah, but really, it was it was kind of one of those things. I like Johnny Depp movies. They're not always winners. Uh, blockbusters, obviously, are not always winners. But I do remember seeing commercials, and I was like, what happened to that? Mm -hmm. And it's for free, and, you know, might as well give it a shot. I mean, if it's totally different than last week, then that's good. Yeah. And if it's good, that's even better. But if it's bad, then we'll let you know. I appreciate the excuse to watch it. I mean, I had this thing borrowed from a friend sitting on my shelf, and I gave it back to her. I never watched it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a stellar recommendation right there. Like, I couldn't even bring myself to crack open the uh, the jewel case. I don't make jewel cases anymore. I hate jewel cases. <laughs> which is which is still free, either way you look at it. You still didn't even watch it when it was free. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't imagine, you know, uh, you know, full disclosure, we'll get into it, but I can't imagine paying money for this, even if, like I said, I like Johnny Depp. I don't see going to the theater and saying, this movie, I really want to spend, what, 11 bucks for a ticket for? I mean, no. It's not a theater experience to begin with. No. Mm -mm. But No. So we can launch right into it. And, uh, you know, as I have the wheel to the boat, I will go ahead and get started on the plot and uh, the ins and outs. So this movie is a, it's a character-driven plot that has uh, schemes and uh, uh, double crosses. And it is about a, an eccentric art dealer <laughs> slash uh, art thief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, who Johnny Depp plays and it, it starts out with like a, like a temple of doom kind of intro. I think you guys probably mm -hmm. see the, the resemblance there in more ways than three. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, and, and uh, it, it, it follows Johnny Depp through a, uh, you know, kind of double crosses in regards to a, a Goya painting that MI5, right? MI5, the uh, the British intelligence agency and uh, 
and nefarious art dealers are all kind of after you know he's looking for it just for the for the scratch you know he wants the money because he's going broke yeah yeah he's selling off all his stuff this I, I, we have to talk about it. I mean the, the the opening scene is fantastic I mean <laughs> <laughs> you're getting it set up they they, they love to use the uh, back of the head intro for characters you know when it starts off you see a guy sitting at a table by himself ordering something you just see the back of his head then it cuts over to obviously a Johnny Depp back of the head when it pans around he's sitting at a table with these dealers uh, art dealers, that is, and uh, they they seem real, real legit too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But uh, then it does the pan around, and you see <laughs> you see Johnny Depp with this mustache, and uh, <laughs> they're even giving him crap about it, right? I mean, they're like, uh, "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody gives him crap about that stash. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like the running joke through the whole movie because this is something he's just currently decided to do because all the other Mordecais before him had a mustache and uh we're all mustachioed men <laughs> I'm sure we'll get into more more of that as we go along but it breaks off into where he's double crossed these people that he's selling something to and they're not happy with him and they decide that the new piece of art that he's bringing they're going to keep it and the money that they brought to give him because he gypped them before on something else and they plan on cutting his pinky off, or a finger at least. And then the craziness kicks in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, much like uh, Temple of Doom, he's got a um he's got a, a man waiting to agitate on his uh on his call. And uh, that's his uh his his manservant Jacques. jockey. Yeah. <laughs> who um who I came to find out in looking into the novel series that this is based on. It's based on the first novel in uh in the series about um, <clears throat> Charlie uh, uh, Mordecai called uh, Don't Point That Thing at Me. Hmm. It's like a 1960s, you know, and, and you can see definitely like Pink Panther Absolutely. kind of vibes here. Yeah. So it's like a 1960s intrigue novel series. And, and you know, that makes a lot of sense. If you watch it and you're like, well, there's something familiar but strange about this. It's a 1960s hmm. novel, you know, and... and uh, and without knowing that, I think it loses something. So maybe they should have built that a little more. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think you just, you nailed everything I was going to say about this movie already is, if you like the Pink Panther movies, this one feels a lot like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, more than those remake ones did, even. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, it didn't seem like they spared any expense. They definitely didn't for talent. No. Yeah. And, and what I was going to say, and I don't know if I got to it, was that when I was looking into the novel, I found out that Jockey, uh, well, the character's name is Jock Strap. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. It, that fits him. So, I mean, that's the kind of highbrow humor you're getting here. Yeah. Well, being that he has that problem that he has, too, that's perfect. <laughs> right, right. I mean, and, yeah, it's it's all very lowbrow disguised as highbrow. I mean, there's like fart jokes and, and the, the whole mustache thing. Yeah. Um, to your point, you know they they get through this this uh, art deal gone wrong uh, because Jock starts beating people up, <laughs> and there's you know you, you there's a bar you know all the bottles are gonna get shattered and somebody's gonna get slid down somebody's gonna get set on fire I think like three or four people get set on fire. I love the fact that Jock gets his hands caught on fire and he's punching people and setting them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I, say, I say admittedly, Jock uh, is played by Paul Bettany, which I always love in anything he's he's in ever. And yeah. he's the he's the reason I I truly enjoyed this movie like what I did enjoy because he's just he, he's awesome <laughs> like you said he's punching people with his arms on fire and he's lighting them on fire and he's not even bothered he's on fire until like it's over he just shakes it out a little bit and yeah his, his calm demeanor right so his arms are on fire and he's looking at Mordecai and saying run sir <laughs> well, <laughs> his arms are on fire and he's punching people you know <laughs> yeah I agree I I think that he was a high point in this movie. Um, because he, he doesn't exactly chew up the screen. He's not, um, and he's not an over actor like, like Johnny Depp is, but he plays this part of, of the, you know, soft spoken manservant who speaks with his fists. You know, he, he does a great job moving on. Uh, you know, they, they get back. There's a lot of jet setting in this movie. You know, they, they go from Hong Kong to London to, LA to London to Moscow, you know, and, and it's all just kind of like, it could be filmed anywhere. Really. 
it's just kind of showing how pervasive this whole plot goes. And I'm not sure it's necessary. Uh, you know, it, but it's the it's the art dealer we- world, right? So it's in more international. Sure. It's jet-setting, star-studded nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. I, so I didn't hate it, but, but absolutely, like, there, there was a lot of filler. And if they could have pared it down, and it would have been a better movie. Uh, to your point, Jock is a great character, and he's a lot of fun, mainly because he's so understated. But he does have a problem, and I think Rick mentioned it. <laughs> and, you know, Jockey's a poon hound. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Anywhere, everywhere, anytime. Every time he turns around, he's... I mean, we we find this out when they go out to this farm uh, and Mordecai and, and Jacques are having to take off quickly in a car because the farmer starts shooting at him with a shotgun. And he's like, what are you? What have you done now, Jacques? And it turns out that he was banging the farmer's daughter <laughs> while they were there. And he's like, how do you, how do you even find the time? He's like, uh, two times, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I say my notes say Jock apparently kicks ass and gets ass. <laughs> it it's true. Yeah. A lot of the plot is explained by Johnny Depp as a voiceover. Yeah. And you know, as he's he's describing his his uh his humble manservant Jock, uh, you know, he, he made sure to mention that he's uh he's quite the ladies' man whenever and wherever possible. Yeah. Yeah, just every time you turn around he's eyeballing somebody or has just tagged somebody and uh yeah, it's just kind of a running joke there for sure. It kind of makes the overstatement of, of Mordecai uh, a little funnier when it, when they understate him so much because it's like you're looking at what Mordecai actually does in the movie. Yeah, it's mostly just run his mouth. That's it. <laughs> yeah, right. He even you know disastrously shoots Jock several times. <laughs> the, the shotgun bit. Yeah, <laughs> the shotgun bit's hilarious. <laughs> it hits him with a it's, car. It's, it's a. <laughs> Right, it's an aside, and again, this is very novel, right? You know, you, you know, this is half of a page where it's like, at one point during a hunt, I, you know, it, I think he shoots Jock by accident, and he says, "This isn't the first time that I've accidentally <laughs> shot Jock." And they they go to this other one. I mean, the the jokes are are well done. I just don't know that they that they carried the movie because mm-hmm. the movie was stretched so long. Mm-hmm. So you know, they 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 go back. You meet him. You, you meet Mordecai's wife. Uh, who's played by Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. And she despises the mustache as well. Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I got here that there's the mustache gag, uh, literally. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so there's a gag that, you know, everybody hates the mustache, and, and she refuses to sleep with him or do anything intimate because the mustache makes her gag, and then her <laughs> gagging makes him gag. And I think the makers of the movie were like, you know, if you don't like the joke, we'll just ram it down your throat until you do like the joke. Yeah. Yep. Easily like 15 times. <laughs> yeah. Quite a few, like in the same scene too. It isn't like stretched out. It's like, well, let's do it five times now. And then, and then twice later. But so, um, she, she has him sleep in his office or the, the living room or somewhere. Yeah. The, there's that whole dynamic of the, of the wife unhappy with his decision in this case to grow a mustache. The way she, the way she clowns on it, actually almost reminded me of like Deadpool when they keep on clowning on Deadpool's face. There's like a line where she tells him that she looks, he looks like he has a vagina on his face. Yeah. It, but it, it goes so far that it almost turns into like a, a Saturday night live kind of skit where they're making fun of his mustache. Yeah. True. And, and again, they, they have these go-to jokes, which I, I have to think that if you read the novel series, you're like, Oh, it's finally been done. But who's read the series? Cause I'm, I'm sure people have, but maybe they should have been the target audience in a way that they weren't. Right. Anyway, I mean, the, you, to your point, Jockey's a fun character, and and uh, you, you meet Gwyneth Paltrow. Great actors in this. Ewan McGregor plays the the liaison to MI5, and he brings uh, Mordecai in because of this art heist. Yeah. And you know, Mordecai, you know, negotiates because now he is uh, <laughs> eight million dollars in debt. <laughs> <laughs> to the yep. queen in Texas. Yep. <laughs> so you know he has no choice really but to uh, but to take this job in, in hopes that he can settle up his financial dealings. And, and so you know he ends up uh, kind of begrudgingly working with Ewan McGregor, who is who's kind of an old foil who used to you know who pines after his wife, mm-hmm. yep. Joanna. 
Yeah, it even cuts back to back in the dorm days, and he's built up the courage to go say something to her. And she, he opens the door, and she's in bed with with Mordecai, and he's like handcuffed to the bed rails. Oh, do you mind shutting the door, sir? <laughs> hey, the best part about that is that he's handcuffed to the bed rails, and she's wearing one of those like the police hat, constable yeah. on patrol hats, <laughs> yeah. like like the. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's the best thing for me, at least. Huh? <laughs> I, I like she's the practical voice in it, too. Like, she's like, we're going to start selling off some of this stuff. And he's like trying to act all bourgeois still. He's like, you're going to have to start picking this crap you want to get rid of because you made us poor, dude. <laughs> right. Not my horsey right, right picture. <laughs> I think that she intimates at some point that she could pay, but he says he would have none of it. So she obviously has money, too. Yeah. That's why I think they play it so flip. You know, the whole him being in debt thing, it's more of a matter of pride because this guy is is slimy rich, like yeah. from his family. He ends up staying with Jockey in Jockey's house at some point. And of course, you know, Jockey's in the other room uh, banging away on the <laughs> uh, guest. And I, I, there, there are some uncomfortable jokes, but I yeah. think in the 60s, maybe that was like par for the course. It's like, you know, and everybody's, everybody's free in love. He's like, I'll just sit here and eat my dinner uh, by myself, I guess, on your couch. And you know, so we we move on again. This this movie jet sets everywhere. You've got a print that has been found, and there's a lady that was restoring it that gets killed, and that's kind of the backbone of this whole story. There's a a so-called terrorist guy that uh, goes in and takes the print supposedly, but on his way out, somebody whacks him in the head and takes it, and they. There's a group of them that think Mordecai has got it. And he doesn't fly to Russia. They come and knock him out and take him to Russia. <laughs> Good point. Good point. You know, and I, I was kind of rescanning the movie. And, and like, it, the plot moves so much that I'm, I'm kind of accustomed to the Hail Ming hitting the high points thing. Yeah. And uh, I, di- I didn't do like a... I had to look over the plot because this plot is pretty complicated. Yeah, it, it, it bounces around a lot. But again, if, if you think of it from the... The art world aspect, you know, you got your uh, guys from Russia, you got the L.A. bunch, so you can see where this ties in. But, yeah, man, this guy just has him uh, knocked in the head and brought to Russia, and uh, they're going to hook a car battery up to his nuts. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Johnny Depp gets up and goes and looks out the window, and there's Jacques down there with a motorcycle, and he's like, hey, just jump down here. (laughs) So this big bodyguard guy has got a hold of him, and he just shoves him through the window and lands on the ground on top of this guy. <laughs> and Johnny Depp's pants are down, and he's just stumbling in the street going, Hello, I need to use your telephone. It's like Ozzy walking around out there. And, uh, yeah, Jacques grabs him, throws him in the motorcycle, and takes off with him and just keeps saying, uh, Balls. <laughs> <laughs> balls. Yeah, this movie is very Indiana Jones, now that you mentioned that. With all the mm-hmm. jump, jumping around in planes, getting knocked out and waking up somewhere else. All you needed was the shot where it would show a map and a red line would go from one yeah. place to the other. I mean, it's the only thing it's missing. What's quick travel by map, guys? <laughs> right. And, and instead of the, the map with the red line, in this case, they, they have an airplane graphic that flies over the Titanic letters of the next... <laughs> city so it's like a a plane flies over london you know on on like a green backdrop i want to mention that romanov the the guy who has him you know pulled to moscow he keeps saying open your balls Yeah, open your balls (laughs) and and which of course i mean and johnny depp's like is that is that a statement what does that mean open your balls and he yeah Uh, the whole balls thing really played (laughs) You know what? I'm enjoying it more talking with you guys about it. I think so. I really am. I, I didn't not enjoy it. It it, it was a lot. Yeah, I, I enjoyed some parts, but I, there was a lot where I was just like, meh. Yeah, I think they could have just pared it down. Like I said, you know, there was just they could have even cut out some of the trips and just kind of told you what happened later. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, you, but it's still an hour and a half movie. I mean, you gotta you gotta have something uh, to put in the film, right? Yeah, it wasn't that long, so that that is kind of the problem too. You can't cut it down much, or it's going to be a TV episode. Well, I mm. think if you if you think if you look back at it and you look at it by scene, you're going to see that it actually moves pretty. It does move really quick, but the whole scene at the 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 car repair shop, right, where the the ass- assassin guy, somebody's shooting at this car, somebody's shooting at me. I mean, it's again, it's 
It's huh. Pink Panther. It's Pink Panther. This movie is is Pink Panther. Uh, or the jerk. Somebody's shooting at the well, kids. Got, yeah, it's got. <laughs> I mean, it's got elements of that. But oh, that's a, it, that's instantly the first thing you think of when you see it. Yeah, for sure. I, I have written down here, much like Seaborg, it doesn't know <laughs> when to quit. But but in a way, Seaborg had more heart. <laughs> Uh, Maybe it's because I know all these actors are getting paid, right? Uh, because you're not getting Gwyneth Paltrow and Ewan McGregor and Johnny Depp and uh, and, and to your point, um, Paul Bettany for chump change. So, you know, I, I kind of, I guess I held them to a higher standard. I'm like, I'm not having as much fun as I feel like I should with this star-studded cast. I, I can't complain. I mean, I think Mike Kep, who, who directed it, did a great job of, of, of creating fast-paced action and, and humor it's just somewhere in there, it, it kind of seemed like I was I was looking at my watch. I'm right opposite, man. I had a blast of this movie. I mean... It, That's awesome. It's it's That's even... Good. Second watch was even better. And Becky and I both watched it, and she was like, I really like this movie, and even recommended it to Sierra. Mm. That's great. I watched it with Lois, and she enjoyed it, too. I think first time around, you're trying to take too much in, because we're watching it and trying to remember high points to talk about. But I think as a whole... I, I, th- I don't know. I think it's a fun movie. I, is it great? Nah. But it gives me the same satisfaction of watching the Blake Edwards stuff. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think it was bad. Like I said, it's just a little bit meh at points. Just like, I was like, I can't. I'm not too excited. It's from the 2000s. What do you expect? Right. <laughs> Paul Bettany and uh, and even Ewan McGregor, for me, made it worth watching. Like yeah. their, their, their appearances in the film and, and even a f- few other characters that showed up. I just I like the jabs, right? I like the uh, I'm going to keep your wife well informed, and you know all those you know I'm going to keep her filled in, and you know mm. there's just little jabs at each other that are mm-hmm. you know trying to get under each other's skin because they don't like working with each other. the The whole deal with giving him the good cheese. I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> see, we're sitting here laughing about I it. Forgot but, about yeah. that. That was a good scene. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's true. There 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 is a scene for you guys out there that were um. He sends he sends someone off for refreshments and and he uh and he obviously has some cheese that he has set aside for just <laughs> when uh when you and McGregor's character who I wrote down somewhere here where, where where he shows up because he he wants him to have stinky cheese oh uh, agent Maitland or Matland and and the, so the whole scene becomes him trying to watch for when he eats the cheese and you know he keeps saying something and then like. Moving it back away from his mouth. Well, it yeah. opens with the wine first, though, because he gives him the wine. He goes, give him the really crappy stuff. And he gives it to him and he drinks it. He's like, hmm. He's like, and he's sitting there secretly laughing like, oh, this guy is not as hoity-toity as he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah, the cheese, man. He's, he sends uh, Jacques in there to get the cheese. And, che- and he's even looking at, at Mordecai like, uh-uh, no, that's not a good idea. Because he don't even have to go in there and get it. He He gets up to the cabinet and starts... Huffing so he can get a good breath of you know to hold his breath so he can reach in there and grab this stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm feeling better about my choice now. Like I said, I didn't dislike it. I think just and part of it was I knew it was my choice and I would have and I didn't want to over defend it because it had been my choice. Oh yeah, I think it's good to. I mean, with what we're doing already with the show, is just to widen what we're picking. Right? This there's so much different stuff on Doobie that I picked yeah. a movie about a alien cyborg. You know the goo, and you're picking this, which is actually, you know, actually a pretty decent movie. Yeah. And you know, it just, but it's all over the spectrum. That's, I mean, I think that's what we need to do anyway. So, yeah, yeah. it's a good pick. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it wasn't a chore, you know, because I would hate to, to do that to y'all. And you know, to your point, Sheborg was not a chore for me. It took me a while to get through it, but that's just because I don't have a lot of time. And I really enjoyed it when we got done with it. You know, it's just a different kind of movie. So, you know, so moving on with the plot, it, it turns out that this particular Goya has been missing and it had a part in the World War II and there is a map to Nazi gold on the back of the painting. So that's one of the reasons why everyone's after it. Apparently the location to a, a trove of Nazi boils was written on the back of the portrait and, and so it, it carries more than just its worth as an art piece. Right. So that leads even more people to be interested in it, including uh, including Mordecai, because, mm-hmm. well, you know, he's got financial problems. So some Nazi gold, hey, he'd be welcome. It right. would be a welcome uh, addition to his <laughs> coffers. I mean, when in doubt, bring Nazis in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you got to do, right? Uh, and also the twist of 
the whole idea of the lady at the beginning that's fixing this this painting, you find out that she wasn't doing any touch-ups to it or anything. She was actually copying it. Right. right. She was a forger. So everybody is chasing the fake painting. Right. And, and that's, that's what makes it, you know, by the end, in this type, this type of movie, you end up with... <laughs> you end up with you, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yep. You end up with Jeff Goldblum. I was going to mention that, too. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> I was not going to, but just so you know, I was not going to gloss over Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> If you're watching the movie, you're going to catch the plot. You're going to miss some of the plot. It's just kind of one of those, somebody in the movie is smarter than you are, or at least that's the way I watched it. Like, yeah, there's a fake and there's a real one, and that's going to play into our protagonist outsmarting all the antagonists because they don't know that there's a fake. I'll say, yeah, I pre- what I appreciate about this movie was that it, it didn't feel like it pulled the wool over my eyes. With mystery movies, absolutely, that is what I hate. Is when it gets to the end, and this happens with horror movies too. Like the word, like it gets to the end, and there's no way you could have predicted it. Like it didn't give right. you clues at all that led to that assumption, and it just they just it just comes out of left field. This movie did not feel right. like that, and yeah. you know, I, I it's it's totally for me unenjoyable to watch a film where like oh there's a there's this big twist reveal and you're like no because I couldn't have seen that coming possibly. Yeah, I mean it at least has to be somewhat credible, right? It's I always use Scream 2 as an example. I think the movie's great till you find out who it is at the end. It's just basically, well, I'm the mom of the guy that died in the first movie, and this is just some random guy that wants to help me kill people. What? <laughs> this is some dude I found at 7-Eleven. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, uh, the great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Great. <laughs> or pick any of your Shyamalan movies, right? I mean, you jump over the fence, and you've just been, you know, trapped in this isolated camp forever yeah <laughs> well so Goldblum shows up as... <laughs> Goldblum shows up as an American art uh, collector who managed to get the painting by having it stashed in the Rolls Royce that he was buying from Mordecai right yeah yeah and how's that for some twists and turns you know yeah. there, there's a that Rolls Royce that was getting shot at in that other scene uh, the guy who the mechanic who was working on it was actually stashing the painting in the in the roof upholstery of this car for Jeff Goldblum, who, you know, I think everybody played down to Johnny Depp in this movie, except Jeff Goldblum, who is <laughs> incapable of doing that. So so Jeff Goldblum is just kind of like confronting Johnny Depp in that scene. And I wish there was more of it because because he's cut short too soon. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is just just Jeff Goldblum no matter yeah. what movie he's in that, and that's something it's I true. like about him is he's it doesn't matter if he's in Thor or whatever he's the same Jeff Goldblum character <laughs> no matter what and it's greatness it's true yeah nobody puts Jeff Goldblum in a box <laughs> <laughs> no so I mean you, you've and so you've got Jeff Goldblum and his daughter is Olivia Munn who is a nymphomaniac yeah and again you, you've got to <laughs> you got to take your hat off for the 1960s because you know i don't think you have nymphomaniac characters in in mainstream movies anymore (laughs) and you probably should yeah it's a shame (laughs) it's a shame people we need more of that they're very underrepresented (laughs) (laughs) so yeah and and despite the fact that she's a nymphomaniac it it doesn't really become an issue especially with jockey around you you think think of that possibility of Olivia and Jacques getting together and being a couple that not only just bang 24 hours a day, but they fight crime. So, <laughs> That's a- so, so to your point uh, earlier, uh, Matt, about this movie being, you know, kind of kind of on the verge of being short. I think if they had taken a little less off the front or taken a little more off the front and, and added a little more on the back, you know, after the the Jeff Goldblum American connection, because. The American connection is like, what, three jokes, you know, one about the bikinis and one about American culture. And then and then Jeff Goldblum's introduced. And then right after it, Jeff Goldblum, Goldblum's pretty much dead. Yeah. Yeah. If they just if they just padded that part of it just a little bit. Yeah, maybe. But it moves so fast. It's hard for me to judge, you know, because there was a lot of story to stick in this movie. And it, I just, you know, the pacing was weird. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, too, is it. uh I'll say make it a shorter. I don't really think you can because it already kind of feels, which I liked. It feels like it, they're taking you and dropping you into a story that's already going. 
which right, right. I, I like that as well because I don't think I when movies like are too much to like build this character do that do this it, they, they kind of make you feel like you're already in the story like you should know these people and I kind of like the way they did that with this one so I think taking any more out might have like not allowed them to create the interest in the characters because that's all that yeah. time was I mean the only guy you really got a backstory on is you and McGregor's character right yeah because of going back to the school days but everybody else is just like they're just who they are yep that's you oh know? that's that's good old Mordecai that's what yeah. he does. Well, and, and I get the feeling that in the novels, his wife bails him out of trouble more than, than maybe in this story. Because she goes and finds out about the Nazi gold thing uh-huh. as kind of a side plot. She goes and meets <laughs> uh, the Duke, who uh, who you know tells the story of the... the and this guy is, is uh, has experiencing dementia. Yeah. And uh, so his stories are not exactly lining up. But there's a lot of innuendo in that conversation as well. Yeah. Well, it, well, you think it is, you think it is because she keeps he keeps saying about visiting the laboratory and kind of giving this kind of thing, but right. really, he's actually telling her that that's where the painting actually is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but it's, but that, I mean, yeah, it, it looks like a straight up sexual innuendo, but really, you know, because they're talking about finding the painting, his partner, whoever finding it. And that's where it is. But he didn't come out and say it. He just kept saying, go back because you're an attractive lady. You want to go check it out. And yep. when she recollects that, then she understands. Wow. Well, that's where the painting is. Right. right. And that's kind of at the end. Right. You know, it's kind of revealed at the end, like you said, that, that she figures out that he wasn't as uh, as demented as, as she thought he was. Yeah. Uh, she thought he was being a dirty old man. And really, he was he was trying to tell her. That uh, if you're interested in that Goya, well, you know, I got it in the bathroom. Yeah. Because uh, I love the fact that when she first arrives and he's all like, Lady Mordecai. Then he gets on the phone and it's like, who is this lady? What does she want? <laughs> <laughs> that was super awkward and amazing. I like that part too. <laughs> I don't know, but she's incredibly attractive. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good aside. And I, I think that in a way, you know, to, kind of to your, to your Pink Panther, it was like, he just stumbles into the solutions where, you know, there, there are actual competent people around yeah. him helping him out. And one of them is his wife. He, I kind of got that feeling that uh, there were a lot of uh, overblown personalities in this. And I think in the novels, if I were to choose to read them, she, she would probably be the one solving a lot of the behind the scenes Absolutely. things and then telling him about it later. Yeah, she's uh, she spot the, the cat from Hong Kong Fui. <laughs> right. He's the one that always actually stopped the crime. Right. Yeah. Right. That's true. Or Inspector so, Gadget. <laughs> Penny and uh, the, the dog. Right. Yeah. Brain. So yeah, I mean that's and that's the thing is you know Mordecai is getting the the illusion that he's all that and really it's the people around him that keep him from making the biggest mistakes. Right, and he's not an adult. I mean he he's well, <laughs> no. he kind of is, but he's not dumb. Right. He just is is kind of obtuse. No, I wrote. I think I wrote in my notes. He's he's not dumb, but he is kind of a tool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know that's what makes him interesting because yeah. he probably could be, you know, what John McClane or something. He could be an action hero, but instead he's just kind of a goofball who's smart enough to get by, but lazy enough to not want to. Yeah, yeah. He's he's had things given to him his whole life, and then when real things happen. He's never the one to bail himself out. It's always somebody else. Yeah, so they, they return, to return back, he goes to L.A. to uh, track down the painting that he thinks is the real one that's been sold in his Rolls Royce. And uh, he ends up getting hit on by Olivia Munn, who's a, a notorious nymphomaniac. And then, you know, Jeff Goldblum's like, hey, have you had my daughter yet? Everybody <laughs> else has. <laughs> Being Jeff Goldblum. Oh. And then they decide, you know, this is where Jock has you know, the, well, when nobody's looking, we just take the painting. Yeah. Well, that, that's brilliant, Jock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it doesn't work out that way because uh, it turns out that Krampf, who is uh, Jeff Golem's character, has been killed and the painting has already been taken. Lo and behold, uh, Olivia Munn is in cahoots with the thief. Yep. Yeah. He's uh. He, well, he's the guy from the very beginning that was trying to steal the painting at the lady's house. So yeah. He's just he's the running. They call him the terrorist, right? 
Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, because there's there's actually a fencing duel between he and, and Mordecai. <laughs> that, that's, that's, you know, of course, you know, he's holding the sword up and it gets broken in half and all, all that good stuff. Yep. Yeah, I, I I thought it was funny. I thought they brought uh, the fact that it was Olivia Munn specifically. I felt like they were trying to drag in another crowd. Because oh, yeah. uh, what, what what was that? Uh, she used to do the host of that video game channel. I can't remember what that was. Yeah, I mean, well, she was a host on several shows that were uh, nerd specific. Right. She was the <laughs> she was like the, the the champion for champion hot girl for nerds. So yeah. bringing her bringing her in, I thought was trying to drag in another. They were trying to bring in another crowd. Work for me. Yeah. That was a high point. (laughs) (laughs) Say she played um, one of my favorite X-Men characters in that kind of not so good X-Men movie. She played Psylocke in the Apocalypse. Yeah. And she teased that, you know, there was teased that she was going to be in the Iron Man uh, movie as as a main character. And she turned out to just be a reporter in a scene because, you know, they found out that she was going to be in it. And then they were like, well, we can't back away from all these people who are just going to come see the movie because Olivia Munn's going to be in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they kind of gave her a bit part. Yeah. Show enough. <laughs> and, you know, so, so in, in, to that degree, um, I remember her on that show. It was, it was on one of those cable channels that was short lived for gamers. And, oh. and she did things like ate donuts that were suspended from the stealing and, and, and did stuff with hot dogs because, you know. Oh, I got it. Yeah. G- Attack of the show is G4. Attack of yep. the show. Attack of the show. I take nothing away from her. She she hustled every bit of the time to get there. And she was a fun character. And, <laughs> and although she was an infomaniac, she didn't do it with Jockstrap. So, what's up? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was supposed to be for the sequel. That will never happen. Yeah, I, I don't think this one's going to be resurrected for anything. The whole thing culminates. You've got a fake painting and a real painting. And uh, the whole thing culminates into an auction where they figured out some scheme to make sure that the right painting goes in the right hands and the wrong painting goes into the the bad hands and everybody makes it out with a whole bunch of money. Because again, this is another moment where I didn't exactly check out, but I was kind of like, well, just tell me what happened afterward because I'm not going to be able to figure it out during. There's too many things moving hands and, and too much stuff going on. And they get back to the auction house and, and you know, the auction's going on. Uh, I think while he's having the duel with the terrorist. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm just kind of waiting for it to, to, to pan out and see what happened. I, you know, and I saw a lot of reviews where people said they checked out. I didn't exactly check out of the film. I just kind of checked out of figuring out what was happening in the film. Yeah. And, and I think you're kind of hitting on it, too, because you said it's, you know, from, from the 60s or whatever. But, you know, you're taking something that's really been done and done and done over and over. I mean, you know how this is going to end, right? And I think that's why you kind of check out, because you already know the end game of this story. Yeah, know? that's a good point. Maybe in 1962 or whenever Don't Point That Thing at Me was written, it wasn't quite the overused trope that it is now. Right. Because you've seen all the Ocean's Eleven movies, so you know that at the end you're going to find out that what you saw yeah. wasn't really what you saw, so you don't even bother to look at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it is a flaw that it has just due to you know the, what, what time is done to a story like that because you already know how it ends. You know, they don't throw you any loops as far as that. No mm-hmm. twist, right? It's pretty much <laughs> you know what's going to happen, and sure enough, that's kind of what happens. <laughs> yeah, they don't do the playing with their expectations thing in this one. Like, I didn't, yeah. didn't feel like they knew their audience enough to be like, we know our audience is going to expect this, so we're not going to do this. They just kind of just played it out right. as it was going to play out. Yep. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think if you disconnect that and you can watch it for what it is, then it really doesn't bother you. But I can see where you kind of go, yeah, I already, I've seen this, right? Right, right. And, and again, I hadn't checked out. I was just, I guess maybe that's why it seemed long to me is mm-hmm. because I saw all the things in play. And I knew that there was enough complexity that even if I tried to figure out what was going on, I wasn't going to figure it out. I was just waiting for it to end to see how they tell me it worked. See, I kind of, to me, I already kind of knew that he was going to end up with the original. And all this setup was to get everybody to turn on each other and get rid of the competition. And we saved the day. Yep, the big wrap up. (laughs) Yeah. And there there was one, I, I don't know if you can call it a twist, but there was a final joke. Right. Where um, where Romanov, the most Russian name ever, um, where Romanov, the nefarious Russian art dealer, gets 
the um, the painting and it you know they've they've done something to hide the painting on top of another painting so he thinks he has it and when it's revealed it's actually this what this this bulldog <laughs> with a human face <laughs> it's a bulldog with witch and churchill's face on it <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of that invasion of the body snatcher scene <laughs> <laughs> right right uh I just, it was shown earlier in the movie, and and uh, weird. I didn't expect it to come back up again. That's a very British thing too, because I mean, he always there's multiple pictures of Churchill walking around with his dog. It was like his favorite thing in the world. So combining that, I think they even called him the bulldog, right? So, mm. well, yeah, I mean, he kind of looked like one. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part of the whole movie though is the very end when Isaac comes out of the corn, and he goes, "We're all coming for you, Mordecai." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it just and then it just has like the French the fin, right? Like it's over. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> oh, ho. <laughs> so yeah, to find out that it was a novel, and I wrote down the the author's name is Carol Bonfiglioli. Wow. So um, it was it was a novel by uh, Carol Bonfiglioli, and it was called uh, v- Don't Point That Thing at Me. I mean, it kind of gave me... <laughs> Sounds very British. Yeah. Big Leone. <laughs> Let me try to Google you know, the name of it rather than the guy's name, though. That sounds kind of easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're they're called the melting pot for, for some reason, right? Oh, wait, no, no, that's not them. Uh, never mind. <laughs> We've gone through the plot of this movie. I'm just going to say that, that for me, uh, I hate to say it, but but uh, it's a nah. I say it's a... <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a toss-up. Is there a middle one? <laughs> How about a, a meh? Meh. <laughs> if you got the time, then by all means, yeah. check it out. It's 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 not a badly done movie. It just um it's an overdone movie. How about that? And uh, and the talent in it is is every bit as good as you expect it to be. The actors all you know chew up the screen mm-hmm. or. Or back off, you know, whatever is appropriate. They they know what they're doing, and the filmmakers knew what they were doing. To me, it, it, I enjoyed it. To me, it's, if it's a if you were homesick one day from work, you could throw this on and be somewhat entertained. That's true. Right, yeah. but it would take some attention. I can't really call it a background movie. It, it also doesn't take too much attention. You could enjoy it. Just I I will say I liked it better the second viewing. So you might want to throw that out there too. Is you know, the first time I was kind of like, yeah. And after the second time, I was like, you know what? This is all right. Well, there you go. So we've got two, we've got a nah, we've got a yeah, and then we've got a meh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and also, I just wanted to say that when we started this, Danny said, we should be able to get through this one pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, like you were saying, I think, I think for me, it was a little bit more fun to talk about. And then I'm talking about it. It might have gotten my score on the movie up just a little bit, just by hashing over what was going on in it. Man, that's great. I mean, you know, and I, I, I agree. Talking about it made me enjoy it more, and also because I, I knew that when I was watching it, I was kind of thinking, I wonder how you guys would feel about it. And the fact that you guys both had a positive experience with it, and uh, not that originality is my number one, but it's just you know it's been done and i'm not sure that i would go back and watch a lot of the pink panther movies either yeah. not that they're not good it's just i i i don't have time in my life for it so but, that's kind of my that's my reasoning but if it was hudson hawk <laughs> oh man i've probably seen that movie 25 times <laughs> i've uh, i have a guilty enjoyment of hudson hawk i, uh, I that's what that's what kills me because we'll talk about these movies and go, yeah but hudson hawk Uh, (laughs) it drove my dad nuts (laughs) i think it's all the fact of whenever you see it and if you either latch on to it or you don't right so Mm -hmm. and like i said this movie just feels like it's out of time if this would have came out even in the 70s it probably would have made more sense but uh it's kind of odd that it's taken this long for it to see the green light for a movie but it may be because there were so many movies like that that had come out in that time period. You waited till a time where it wasn't happening, and you try to shoehorn it in there. Yeah. I almost kind of felt like they could have brought in another group audience if they had tried to make it feel a little more period, like a more of a period piece. Yeah, that's possible. I also think that timing was, was at the heart of this, and I, I think that it's one of those things where right now we've talked about stories being played out. 
you know, they're looking for sequels on sequels because going in with a with an original idea, unless you're, you know, Wes Anderson and you're just kind of making a genre piece, uh, it, it's not very well received. So they saw a series of novels that did well and they thought, we'll stick some good talent on it and see what happens. And it just wasn't a good gamble for the box office. Right. And think about this. I think Matt was on to something a while ago because look at the target audience they were aiming at, which is the, the Olivia Munn age group who did not grow up watching movies like this. Mm-hmm. So it may be a chance to try to reintroduce a Pink, pa- Pink Panther style movie to a different generation that didn't have that. So for us, it's old hat. Mm-hmm. And that may be kind of the reasoning behind the choices they made of when and who and all that stuff. It's a good call. I'm not here to defend it. I, I gave my <laughs> recommendation and I stick by it. And as we do here on Three Men and Tubi, we're going to point out some other movies on Tubi that you might want to enjoy. I'll start off since I, I might have hit you guys unaware. I, I looked into it. Uh, 28 week la- Weeks Later is on there. And, you know, if you're a fan of the the fast zombie genre, both 28 Days and 28 Weeks have have their their enjoyability. Oh, and, and I was just telling Rick earlier, I watched Predators on there, the 2010 Predator sequel. Of the Predator movies, I'll put, you know, the, the Predator 2 is my favorite. Predator <laughs> 1 is right after that. And then Predators follows after that one. Oh, AVP Requiem does kind of have a, a soft place in my heart. So, you know. Yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> That was just kind of uh, kind of dumb fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. AVP Requiem is is a monster movie. Yeah, that's all it is. It is. Uh, I didn't really pull up any recommendations of stuff that's already out there, so I forgot to even look at that. Uh, that's but okay. I think we talked about it before. Maybe we did the last episode, but Nemesis is out there, and I'm oh. all about some Nemesis. Yeah. And and all the sequels. <laughs> I ain't worried about the sequels so much. <laughs> <laughs> But that first uh, one rocks. I love that movie. Yeah. Uh, I got a couple. Um, one I one I just watched because it's a Christmas movie. Uh, Strange Exports. Oh so, yeah. So yeah, Norwegian Christmas film. Uh, weird naked old men. It's abdu- crazy abdu- man. <laughs> abducting children and it's, okay, that sounds creepier than it is, but it's it's almost weirdly <laughs> it's almost weirdly a family movie because it's pretty tame, but it's like. Yeah. Santa Claus, an evil Santa Claus is looming. It's a great freaking movie. Yeah, it's it's hard to explain. It it's almost uh, you could do that and Troll Hunter back to back, and you would be all right. <laughs> I, ha- I I have done that actually. Yes. <laughs> uh, my other and my other is a recommendation is a, a bit off from that one. Uh, I noticed that the Aquabat Super Show is on there. <laughs> no kidding. I was just trolling around there. I was like, oh. Okay, now I need to watch the rewatch the Aquabats. So if you haven't heard of the Aquabats, they're like a, a group, and they actually release music and stuff too. But they did the show, and it's a bit like uh, a more sci-fi superhero version of the Monkeys. They right. tour around yeah. in a in a van, and then like play fight creatures, and and they break into music sections where they just are like having a montage. It, it's pretty entertaining. Yeah, yeah, I love the Aquabats. I think I know them primarily as a as a as a band. I have a couple of CDs that I haven't broken out in a while, and I might have to do that now. Nice. Yeah. That's all I got. Well, all right. I mean, so that was Mordecai. We have uh, our recommendations, and, you know, you have a general laid out in the plot now. So if you like those actors and you like them in their setting, it's a fast-paced, well-put-together movie that didn't get a lot of critical acclaim, but maybe it's your bag. So we hope you enjoy it, and uh, we look forward to letting you know about another movie yeah, next time. my pick next time, baby. <laughs> yeah, so uh, look forward to that one being a stinker. <laughs> <laughs> uh.